Welcome to the Circularity Edge podcast, where we discuss the latest news and perspectives on the circular economy and issues relating to social, environmental, and economic sustainability. Join us every week when we discuss what's needed to create a sustainable circular economy worldwide. Now, here is your host, Ken Alston. Hello again, this is Ken Alston with the Circularity Edge podcast. Today, my special guest is Stephen Bethel. Stephen is co-founder of Bank and Vogue and Beyond Retro. He's a pioneer in post-consumer textiles and now a mini movie star with the release of the short film, The Second Hand Superstar. Welcome, Stephen. <laughs> well, movie star, I'm not sure we're there yet, but I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, you, you've got to start somewhere, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I will, I will put a link in the... Um, in the in the text with the podcast uh, so people can watch uh, watch the little film <laughs> well, the first thing that struck me Stephen when I was watching the, the little movie was um, how much fun and enjoyment everybody seemed to be having um, <laughs> tell us a little bit about how you got started in the, this whole post-consumer textile world and uh, and how that journey has evolved uh, yeah so uh, yeah how did, how did how did it start you know it was, uh, believe it or not, it was love at first sight. Um, I, I walked into a warehouse um, uh, in Ottawa, the, the, where I'm from, uh, in Canada, and it was a combination of three charities that had um, collecting, were collecting clothes in our uh, city. And, you know, this is a business of volume, you know, and, and mass. And, and, and you just, you, your eyes, it's hard to imagine, but, Imagine that Americans buy 450 million pairs of jeans a year. And you think about the volume of that and the, the scale of it. Um, so, you know, sort of attracted to that. Uh, and also as, a, as a, um, a young guy, we as a family, we would spend every weekend at auctions, uh, antique auctions. I sort of, sort of grew up uh, loving things that were old and had stories and character which is what really what embodies uh, the secondhand clothing industry. But also, uh, you know, the other element is that um, this is an industry that is also very global and is, and it has really afforded us the, the luxury of being able to go and, and leave our, our community. What it was, this wasn't it, it was Plato who said, you should leave your village Go to the next village, learn something, and come back. And the used clothing market, the used clothing industry, allows for, you know, we sell to 27 countries around the world. And you get some markets like, uh, or some countries like Guatemala, where 80% of the population uh, wears secondhand. So, uh, you know, that over the 25 years of this business, um, What's further made me fall in love with it is the ability to go and meet uh, and be introduced to communities that you probably wouldn't otherwise if if I was a a banker in in uh, in suburban Ottawa. <laughs> yeah, I can relate to that. I I traveled very widely in my sustainability and circular economy uh, musings over the last thirty years, and um, that meeting people where they are and, and getting a sense of other people's cultures is 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 one of the greatest joys. Yeah, it's like to, to expand your horizons and and uh, uh, it, it 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 is a real it is a real is a real joy for sure. When when you look at the you know the the concept of circular economy, which it, which is all it is, it's only a concept, right? It's an idea to make us think in a particular way. Um, we talk a lot about the the missing piece at the end of the use where, you know, we've, we've created terrific systems to get things on the front end to be made and sold and marketed and get things to our homes, whether it be in a brick and mortar store or, you know, through e-commerce these days, but we've, we've never really had the reverse logistics. And the, I guess the first challenge is that, is that re-aggregation. How do you get all of these dispersed items in in the case we're talking about textiles, how do you how do you begin to get them back so that you can begin that whole process that you've obviously 
worked very hard on in sorting and remaking and all the things that followed. You know, I, th I think one of the challenges, I think one of the real challenges when we are looking at how do we make the circular economy for textiles, one of the fears that I have is that um, people will destroy some of the ecosystems that are already there and are working really well. So the conversation about, well, how do we collect the clothes? There are really good aggregators out there who have a really important role in our societies. And those are uh, the charities. So the Goodwills and the Salvation Armies and the ARCs and the uh, Veterans of America, you know, or the St. Vincent de Paul in Ireland, you know, as an example. Um, one of my big laments and something that I, that as a company, Bank and Vogue, is a wholesaler of used clothes. We buy and have bought for years from charities across the United States, Canada, and, and Europe. And this charity element is really a critical one that we not um, throw the baby out with the bathwater. So, th so for sure, uh, there needs to be, uh, you know, a broadening of it. Uh, there needs to be support of it. Um, but I, I, I just think that as a, as a step, there are many who say, well, let's just, um, you know, let's set up these new collection methods. But the reality is that if you, if you come up with a new convoluted way to collect clothes and work around the charities, and I'm not being overly dramatic, but you're essentially taking away a sandwich and a coffee from a homeless person at two o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning. Yeah. Because... Yeah. I've seen, I've seen some of the reports that, you know, sometimes some of these well-meaning um, new online marketplaces where people are trying to, you know, essentially take that, that marketplace away and put it in a different place. Yeah, and I, I so I, I'm a, obviously as a business, we've been big supporters and, in, 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 you know, because we're, we're customers of these charities. But I, I, you know, when brands talk about take back programs, I, 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 I eagerly put up my hand and ask them to think about the repercussions they have on uh, the ecosystem that already exists. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know. I, so I throw that out that um, the charity partners are, are a critical part of, of uh, this first step towards circularity. No, it's a great point. And the thing for me, I always talk to people who watch my or listen to my podcast will know that for me, it's sustainability and circular economy have to be brought together. That they're, they're two different things. And you can have un, yeah. you can have unsustainable circular economies. So, you know, we have to make sure we don't mix up in our heads what it is we're trying to achieve. And I think if we don't have the the sustainability piece added back into circularity, then we tend to forget about the social part. And, and I think what you're talking about with the charities there is a really important part of that, that social mission, which, which has to be part of what, what's included. I think the, so, the biggest gap is uh, just to, to finish the thought is that, um, you know, obviously we want to promote reuse as much as we can. The, 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 the real, um, you know, the real challenge is the markets for um, the unwearable clothes. And so the the next question is, OK, well, how do you sort so that you're going to make feedstock? There's there's one conversation. But then even if you make the feedstock, where are the customers for that feedstock? And can that feedstock compete with existing uh, materials that that are yet to have found a home. And the perfect example here is how does post-consumer apparel compete with pre-consumer cutting waste? And in a market where you can buy, you know, cutting scraps for from cotton mills or cotton, you know, cut cotton soap factories for five ten cents a pound. And how does post-consumer uh, compete with that? In, in, have we created a market that understands the difference between 
you know, sweeping up the factory scraps, which is an accounting exercise, and the hard work of uh, uh, creating markets for post-consumer. Yeah, post-industrial is a completely different different beast and tends to get treated equally when it, it probably shouldn't be. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the work that we're doing is just a lot harder. Uh, it's hard, it, but it's doable, but it's just a lot harder. And if it's harder, it's going to be more expensive. Yeah, yeah. So you, you talk about, um, in the little video you mentioned, the, the concept of it's difficult to unscramble the egg. Talk a little bit about that, because I think this is this to me comes back to uh, an issue that's prevalent in, in the design of everything and anything, not just textiles. And that is, are you designing at the beginning with having in mind that at the end of the initial use, that it, we really want to have another use? And so design for disassembly and all of the other things that come along really ought to be part of the thinking at the beginning, knowing what we want to happen at the end. No, I think it's it's um, it is as a sort of a um, um, the irony is I don't think that you the um, and we've I've had this conversation with uh, with brands where they they'll say look we've designed something and we know in the future there'll be a technology to to be able to sort this and we're actually building something that we don't actually have a solution to dismantle. And it's kind of, it, it's almost hubris, isn't it? Yeah. And that, so one of the challenges is let's say we, we sort through the clothes that we get and there, then let's go to the jeans. We'll pick on denim for a minute. Um, you know, the reality is only about 9% of jeans are hundred percent cotton. Uh, the maybe about um, then when you get into ninety five percent cotton, it maybe is about twenty percent of jeans plus or minus. But there's seventy five percent of jeans that have more than five percent of uh, non cotton in it, and right now there there is no tech to be able to recycle that material. It, other than downcycle it and turn it into something like insulation or, or, or wadding for this, you know, the, the hood of your car. Um, and so one thing I would encourage designers and brands to do is to legislate that if you're going to build something, you need to build it within the parameters of existing um, technology that, that it can be recycled. I mean, it, you know, it's sort of like, and the, and the analogy I would use is, you know, if you have a piece of paper and then you put a, a, a plastic laminate on it, we now know that you can't recycle that piece of plastic. It's sort of obvious to all of us. Yeah. But you're basically doing the same thing with clothes. If you if you have a, a poly cotton blend and there's no tech to be able to, to separate the two, you're going to throw it in the garbage. Yeah, and in, so in that, the classical what... definitions of circularity, you talk about a technical cycle and a biological cycle. You... You can't separate the two to put the cotton in the biological cycle and reutilize the, you know, the poly side of it in, in the technical cycle. Yeah, it's it, you know to be optimistic, there there are there is tech in in lab scale that is close. It's just not there yet. And so so <laughs> yeah, I don't know how we can build things with a hope of the future. That's sort of a, a slippery slope. Yeah, a bit of a hope and a prayer so, rather than having something practical you can do right now. That's it. Yeah, and I, I so I would encourage always the the idea of building with mono materials, 100% cotton, 100% wool, uh, and if need be, 100% poly. Uh, and, and those right now are scaled, uh, you know, workable processes. What about the adornments that get put on... You know the the metal studs and things. Do they do they pose a problem or? I I actually think that uh, the 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 tech is there for um uh for the trims to be removed. Um, so that I don't think that that's. I think that things like, you know, the bedazzling is somewhat problematic, or maybe even like screen uh some of the um the the plastic adornments are can be a problem. But I think the bigger problem is, is trims is less of an issue. 
what really is the big issue is is being able to build materials that are mono materials so that they can easily be um, uh, returned to to another material. And I, I guess so. The, and just to be clear, that the hope, at least in in our head, in my head, is that um, we want clothes to be turned back into clothes. We don't want clothes to be downcycled and then turned into uh, paving stones, you know. So it's you know it's and and that at least in my brain of what the circular the future of circularity could be is can how can how can clothing be an input to new clothing? Yeah, you wrote ideally you want things to be kept at the highest quality level continuously and like you say not downcycling. How have you sensed you know the regular ordinary folks on the street are seeing this industry. Are they are they valuing these reused materials and when you've repurposed them, remade them into something else? Is, is this the value equation seem seem right for people, do you think? Or are we just relying think, on uh, a small number of, you know, more green conscious folks? You know, it's funny, uh, um, 20 years as a retailer uh, in the in, in, in the UK with Beyond Retro, I know, why, why does somebody come to a Beyond Retro? They, they, I believe that they come for, uh, for the fashion. And the fashion story is, is really what leads, you know, this, um, I think is, is the dominant conversation. But I think that, that part of fashion is telling stories. And if you can, uh, if you can weave in uh, the story that, you know, um, look, this pair of Chuck Taylors was made from a vintage Hawaiian shirt, then you're selling an emotive, um, an emotive story about what an amazing product can be. And that's an engaging one. I think that, you know, there are those that understand the severity of, you know, if you grow organic cotton, it takes 13 kilograms of carbon to grow one kilogram of organic cotton. Yeah. Uh, and if you use a, 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 an upcycle material, it's only three kilograms of carbon. There are some people that will know that story. But I think what really what people want is they want that fashion story. They, they want to go out with their friends and somebody looks at their uh, you know, their hat and says, oh, what? That's, that's a cool hat. Where did you, oh, hey, did you know it was, it's a story. I think stories have value in fashion. And, um, uh, and I think they, and, re, but relevance is more important, I think, than, um, than the environmental story. Yeah. You have to reach people on an emotional, on an emotional level. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And, and but I, I I do think that the that we're all reading the papers. You know, we're all seeing that in November a third of Pakistan was underwater. We're all seeing that you know California was on fire, or or was having you know landslides or tornadoes in the southern end. Like we're all seeing that there's something drastically wrong with our planet. And I there's still a I disconnect think, though, isn't it? There's still a disconnect between those big macro things that we see, like you say, on the news and, and our everyday purchasing behavior seems like a world apart somehow. Yeah, and, and, and probably any more of this, I, I probably out on my pay scale, but <laughs> I'm, uh, I, I don't know, I, I certainly think that our customer, the Beyond Retro customer, gets it. Um, and I think that people are voting with their dollars. Um, I'd like to like to think that, but then you'll see the rise of certain um of certain uh, fast fashion brands, and you're like, well, "How does this make any sense?" I know, yeah, sixty yeah. percent of the cost is air freight. And you're like, "What yeah. the heck?" Completely antithetical. So, we, so we've still got some work to do. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think I'm I'm optimistic. I I think you know I've been doing this for a long time, talking about circularity principles before we even had a circular economy 
as a concept. Um, and I think the question I get most often is, so what can I do? You know, when I speak at universities to young people, that's the most often asked question. So what can I do? And I think that the answer that I usually give is really vote with your dollars, you know, vote with your, your pocketbook and try and select things that are more more in line with your, your personal values. If this is something you value, then ask questions of those big brands and say, what are you doing? And if you don't like their answer or they don't give you an answer, then, you know, find someone who will. I, sh I share the optimism. I think in 1971, 72, the, uh, the world came together and signed the Montreal Accord, which uh, was an accord focused on the, on banning chemicals that were bad for the ozone. Uh, yeah, I was in involved in that in the CFCs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you think about it that I feel as if that's a shining example of, I believe that humans are smart in the end. And uh, we all got together. We all figured out this problem. And we all made a path to say, hey, you know, um, and now the ozone is fixing itself. Yeah. And as we saw in a couple, a couple of weeks ago, and I believe that um, what some of these brands are doing is going to be akin to that we're going to look back at it like we look at smoking today and go, why would anybody do that? It was stupid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, and so it, what, what seems obvious to us today, I think uh, in the, in some of the way in which product is being made and, and, and remade uh, it will seem obvious, but I, I, I think that it, right now it's, it's fun to be in this environment of being the guy going, Hey, why are you smoking? That's stupid. Uh, yeah. Number one, but number two is um, this idea that that clothes can be an input to new manufacturing. You know the um, our Beyond Remade line, our you know the gone retro of reuse, um, the the partnerships we have we that we have with Converse, where we're we're we are supplying a material from post consumer that they're making a new product out of. I think those are examples of what is possible in a in, yeah. in a secure economy yeah, you're on your, and, and your a, fifth collaboration with them on on, on our purse is that right yeah i think i i think it might be seventh or seventh mm -hmm. now yeah okay. it, yeah, yeah. And, it, and it's it genuinely um it's a it, you know it's a, it's a real joy to have a partnership like that because it's it shows that of the, the scale of the opportunity and it, and it, and it shows that if you're going to be a supplier to uh, an, a Converse bag who are owned by, by Nike, it just shows that this is possible at, you know, um, at, you know, at a, at a level and, and they, and they are making a beautiful product. You know, and so I, I, well, I, I think, think, I think too, one of the things I thought when I talk with, with, companies, particularly SMEs, I said, look, you know, the things you've already you're already making are tough to remake because you already made all your design decisions and your your supply decision and manufacturing decision way way back when and, and now this is your line that you're selling. But at each new iteration, at each new design, you can change some of your input decisions. And that's really what you've been doing there with Converse. You're saying, okay, well, I haven't changed everything that you I probably still have some plastic materials here and there on the sole or wherever it might be. But hey, we've changed this part. And I think I think honesty in communications is also really important. That you don't say, hey, I've made the sustainable shoe, right? You know, or the circular shoe. But you say, look, we've just done this one thing. We've taken these reused materials and we've changed our uppers. Fantastic. You know, thumbs up for a good job. Now tell us about the next one. When in your next iteration, in this in the eighth iteration, you know, of the work, what's going to be next? And I can buy into a company that's in, on a continuous change uh, process that's, that's doing things as you know as things become possible. It's funny. I I went through. Um, uh, we we have gone through this process in our factory of being audited. Um, this social auditing uh, of our facility. And two years ago, when they sat down with us, they said, we're going to do this and you're going to fail. I'm telling you right now, you're going to fail. And I was like, oh my God, this is stressful. <laughs> but, he's, but the auditor said, look, 
there's going to be a bunch of known unknowns. But what we're going to do is we're going to list out all those unknowns and we're going to make a path for you to fix them. Yeah. And and now two years later, we've fixed all those non-compliances. It was hard work, but I think being honest about uh, an assessment about where you're at um, is a really helpful one, which is which is what we did in, a, in our auditing, auditing process. Um, and so I think that the, the industry uh, needs to have an honest view on, um, you know, the, the, if you're designing something that can't be circular, how do we, how, what is actually able to be done today? And what, what is the path to being able to, to work on materials that can be uh, circular or can be low carbon or can be regenerative or can be, you know, whatever whatever element you're working on. Yeah. 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 I still see brands that are, you know, here in the U S saying, you know, promoting joggers saying sustainably made. Well, you know, what does that mean? It doesn't mean a damn thing really, because you've not been specific in any way, shape or form about what it is you've done. There probably is some element of sustainability that you've made an improvement on. And that's great. But be a, be a bit more specific about it, and don't don't have these vague, you know, basically greenwashing claims. It's it's a double edged sword, though. I would challenge that sentence that you know we are in such a a, a culture of of um, of gotcha moments. You know, it is really quite fun to sort of having those. You know, people uh, are quite eager to to you know pull off the bed sheets, but I think that over eagerness of the gotcha moments has also uh, made brands not even talk about some of the work that they're doing because they're afraid of of having a greenwash label yeah, yeah. To their bum. I'm just I'm simply and arguing guess, for, for specificity, you know that's all. Yeah, yeah. No, no, and I, I'm just I just throw it out there that it's you know, I've been in meetings with some brands of saying, look, we're gonna do this because we know it's the right thing to do, but we're not gonna tell anybody because <laughs> yeah, it, it, it begs the next question. Well, you've done that, but what about the other ninety nine percent? Yeah, I mean, there's always somebody who's going to try and yeah. catch you out, which doesn't which doesn't help in the end. Um, no, 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 no. It's it's not. And, and, and but you know, it's it's these are all steps, and I think that the you know the there there are good steps that are happening in our in a, in our in our world, and that's that's a lot of fun. So, would you say the best the best thing for? You know, the average person to do is just simply to support the the local charities that are doing textile collections. Is that the most straightforward thing to do? Like the first, the first and most critical thing, um, I think is um, is if you're done with a garment, give it to a local charity shop. Support your local charity shop. Make sure that that clothes doesn't go in the in the bin. That you that you you give it to a, a charity because um, that charity will do good work in your neighborhood. The second thing is, uh, I would really encourage people to change their diet. Uh, you know, what percentage of your clothes is secondhand? Um, you know, the American. Uh, you know, the, according to our industry uh, studies. Uh, the average garment lasts two and a half years in the closets. Uh, the, the lifespan is only two and a half years. But you think about something like a, a pair of jeans, they last, you know, they last, you know, well, the Levi's is celebrating 150 years this year of, of making Levi's. So uh, not only would it be to, to, to donate your clothes to a charity shop, but, but spend your dollars at those charity shops. Uh, or or other reuse or vintage shops or you know the, the, why why are we buying so much new product uh, when when you know that's the second thing and then the third thing is to challenge the people that you are buying from of what element is it that is recycled or remade or repurposed and um, I think it's it's sort of funny that I. Uh, doing this work, and I don't know, Ken, you probably have the same thing. I almost feel like I, I, I'm in the movie Matrix, and I put on these glasses, and I now see everything through a carbon lens. And you think about, you know, that pair of jeans going back to it. 
if it takes 13 kilograms of carbon to to grow enough uh, cotton uh, to make one pair of jeans, about a kilogram, all of a sudden that one pair of jeans is 13 kilograms of carbon. Yeah. You know, and 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 so asking the brands um, or voting with your dollars and not buying those uh, that product that is uh, that isn't participating in you know uh, trying to fix the problem maybe that that's maybe that's a path yeah i i would talk about you need know, to change attitude before behaviors can change and so you've got to have that mind shift that makes you think just like you did so i can't see any other way now than sustainably circular that's the only thing i can see that has any hope for putting things to rights and getting to be ultimately regenerative and, and be more like nature and um, but people have to first have that mind shift before they can, you know, then change the behavior. Um, and I, I give an example in some of the talks I give of um, something as simple as a tennis ball. Uh, there was some research from the University of Warwick in the UK that shows a tennis ball these days to, just to play a game at Wimbledon. Has to, the, the, there are 14 different movements of materials and semi-finished goods over 55,000 miles. I mean, think about the carbon involved in that. Just for a darn tennis ball to play a game at Wimbledon, right? Those tennis balls used to be made 120 miles away from London, uh, but aren't anymore. And so, you know, the, the difference in how we've ended up making things in this global supply chain is, is, is amazing. And when you multiply that, if you think about that for a tennis ball and then everything else in the world that we use, the billions of products, I mean, it's not surprising that we're, pumping a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere. But I think you have to, you've got to have that change in your thinking first, and then you can, then you can change your behavior. Yeah. I, on the other hand, I, uh, being, being unpopularly so, uh, somebody who believes in a global economy, um, I think there's real value in somebody specializing in making uh, the elements for tennis balls and um at least in our in our uh, in our trade having areas of specialty of specific materials uh, and being able to have critical mass is a really important element of unscrambling the egg and I'll give you an example um, that, that I love is that in the in the in the clothing business, sweaters uh, represent about five or six percent, uh, like knits represent five or six percent of all clothes. But of that, uh, maybe 60, 70 percent, 60 percent, let's say, is uh, acrylic sweaters. Uh, another 20 percent, let's say, is wool. Uh, and let's say another 10 percent is uh, cotton, but one tenth of a percent is cashmere. Mm. And so, if you're going to try to set up a cashmere uh, program to collect uh, cashmere, and if if we go back to the days when somebody from 120 miles from Wimbledon was making tennis balls, and every every country had its own tennis ball factory, then and if you were trying to set up a recycling program for sweaters using that same analogy where when I started in the, in the used clothing business, every major city in the U S had its own recycling plant for clothing I mean, a sorting plant. The problem with that, that time was that if you wanted to set up a, a cashmere sweater program, you would have to drive from every single city across the United States, collecting a handfuls of cashmere sweaters and then by the time you got to the, the first city again where you started, you could then make the circuitous route again. There is real value in the modern economy of having um, a centrifuge of product going to one place. And then that actually is one of the critical elements that will start the possibility of the circular economy in textiles when you get very specific materials. And so I, it's very unpopular these days to say we should have, you know, materials going all to one place. 
but having materials go to all one place is actually one of the critical elements to being able to set up um, uh, uh, circularity in textiles. Yeah, and I think, you know, I, when, I, when I talk about how many miles things are travel, I'm not arguing against the, the global economy, but I'm just saying we have to think about where the energy comes from to do that. So how do we move that? If, if that's how we're going to do things, how do we move that energy to be more, more clean, renewable than, um, than carbon heavy? Yeah, and, it, and, it, and it's also, you know, did, the, did those tennis balls go in a plane? Did they air freight them because they had, right. you know, a name on them? Did they go by sea? And obviously uh, the way, you know, or did they go by road? And, you know, <laughs> did somebody drive them from Turkey to, uh, to, to the UK? Or did, did they go on a boat? You know, it, it certainly, um, it's funny, actually, you bring up the Wimbledon thing. Is that close to our factory in, uh, in, um, in Gujarat, there's uh, one of the world's largest towel factories, and they make the, the towel. I, I buy one every year for for uh, for the family. They make the Wimbledon towels there. Oh yeah, uh-huh. uh, <laughs> I'm always amused. I find the Wimbledon towels in India, but yeah, you know, yeah. In, in the in the end, they're they're one. I think the factory is about seven kilometers long that makes this thing, yeah. and you know they're incredibly specialized uh, towel manufacturer. Yeah, so, um, so there's obviously a lot of efficiency and effectiveness you come you get from that specialization. Yeah, and I but it, I also see that as a critical element to circularity, at least in our trade, is that having uh, world hubs for sorting hubs uh, creates the possibility, um, and you can do things like collectible trims. You know, as we deconstruct uh, denim, which we supply to to somebody like Renew Cell, we can collect zippers. Well, I can resell zippers. I know I've, why I make new zippers when we've got all these old zippers. Yeah. Um, so how, it, how do you find new markets for things like that? It, would, would there be, would there be benefit in, in having a better way for people who want zippers to, to find them? You know, how do, how does someone in one country or one place know where the, the supply of the used other thing is? There seem to be a, to be a matchmaking exercise that's needed. Yeah, certainly. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> Bank of Oak Services is a team of salespeople out there <laughs> saying, "Hey, you know, <laughs> don't <laughs> you know, don't, don't cut down uh, um, uh, more denim trees because we have a lot of denim that we can sell you." Um, so, you know, I, I think that that's probably one of the one of the tricks. Actually, you know, Ken, you actually kind of brought up something that when we sit with designers and say, hey, you don't need to, you know, uh, use a new piece of fabric. You can use an old one. Uh, And half of it is like it's available. Yeah. And then actually explaining to them what's available. I think most designers love the challenge of being, able, you know, once you lay it on the table to say, hey, here's. Um, and it, it, uh, you know, we can supply denim in these shades. This is the size we can supply. We can cut a component for whatever you're going to make. Um, that giving that toolkit to designers um, is a real aha moment. You know, and it's not even forget about the carbon conversation and forget about the the irony is is that <laughs> you think about this is a little crazy. It, it's going to be one of those moments when I think you look back in 50 years, like I, my, using my smoking analogy, we're making jeans now and we're paying people to put whiskers on them and put holes in the knees. Yeah. It's a little bit funny. <laughs> when I'm saying, hey, if you want aged denim, I've already got it. We don't have to. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to. You don't have to pre-age <laughs> virgin denim. It's sort of, it, it, even, even if we talk about it out loud, it's kind of a funny thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me but see if I can. Do you think the supply and demand matching is 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 optimized, or is, is the scope for? No, it's a it's it's a long ways from it. I mean, as as a pioneer in upcycling and remanufacturing fiber uh, fabrics, and, and and showing designers, it, it's absolutely you know. Um, uh, 
you know, I, I think every time we, we talk about this and we say it's possible, and I think every time somebody picks up a pair of those renewed chucks and says, really, this is really, yeah, well, there's, I mean, if you're asking me, Ken, do I have a lot more work to do? The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm also thinking, but I've been, I've been working with some people in the background on, on some, um, you know, matchmaking technologies. And, you know, the issue is, is always, you've got to have both sides of the match, right? You've got to have somebody who has something to put on that says, hey, I've got this 5,000 zippers from all of these, you know, jeans I've taken apart. And you've got to have somebody else on the other hand who says, oh, I, I'll take 200 of them. You know, I mean, you, you're always you're always trying to balance the supply and demand side. But I think there are there are technology solutions readily available today that we could implement that would would help to to do this matchmaking that, that says, you know, hey, you know what you've got available, but lots of people have no idea. And somehow we've got to Im improve the, the connectivity between those who have something that's reused like the, like you have and, and those who might want them, like, like the designers who, as you say, I think, particularly small independent designers, I think, are, are itching to, to move into this sort of space and, and be part of creating things that are more in tune with their personal values. Their personal values include sustainability and circularity, but they feel their their work is actually, you know, working against their in, their internal values. Um, but they don't know what where to get things or you know how to how to make it part of their daily routine. Yeah, agreed. Totally agreed. Um I don't know I, I don't know a designer that wants to burn up a planet. <laughs> no, they don't. But, but then they're, they're not always sure what they can do, right? It's 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 moving from that's the attitudes changed, but now the behavior has to follow, and they've got to have some some means of finding that you and others who are doing similar things, you know, exist so that they can they can try and utilize these reused materials and um, and trims and other things in in their daily work. I I I, I have to say that. Our experience um, with the upcycling work that we're doing for brands, that's taking existing garments and making components for new garments. The gate is never the designer. The, the, the gates are the merchandisers. Hmm. The guys that are going to say, the, 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 this, you know, these brands have a, a big board table. Creativity and design is one element of it, but the merchandisers, the guys that the, the the people in those businesses that place the company's money on bets, those are are probably our largest gate because they're going to say, okay, if we use an upcycled material, is it cheaper? No. And will it erode margin? And it's the courageous brand. And the courageous merchandiser that says, look, this is a better product. It's a more engaging product. We should place our bets. But I guarantee you that a lot of the, the merchandisers who want to protect uh, margin and immediate profits will uh, will be our biggest gate. And And the real challenge with that is that um, that short-term thinking um, is is really the the biggest gate we have to um, to evolution. You know, and I, and I I feel as if those courageous brands that we that we've worked with and and, and the courageous brands that are, for example, working in uh, investing in renew cells, an example. Uh, you know, and I I would give it a, you know give the example of 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 Levi's, you know that hard work that uh, Levi's did with Renew Cell to make Circulos be part of the new Levi Five Hundred One. Um, that's a courageous moment. That's a brand that's thinking that wants to be around for another one hundred and fifty years. Yeah, and and obviously I I'm that thinking creates an ecosystem where uh, a bank in vogue can collect uh, denim, can collect 100% cotton, can 
uh, sort it for an input to for renew cell and for renew cell to then make a fiber that then goes into that's that's that that's that intriguing moment uh, of true leadership um, and, and scale right and, and scale potential that's it uh, yeah absolutely scale but it's but you can see the real thought leadership is um, is what creates new ecosystems and uh, and supports the work that you know Bank of Vogue is doing and we we. We shipped over a hundred containers last year to to renew cell, and that's a, a post consumer material. That's that's over five million pounds of physical weight of material that's going to go into a new fiber. Um, so that fiber to fiber recycling only happens because the brand leadership says, you know what, we need to do this. This is an important thing. We, we, you know, we can't make product the way we've made it in the past. Yeah. Well, at least in the EU, you've got a lot more governmental pressures and, um, you know, changing legislation, which isn't happening to the same degree elsewhere. But hopefully that's, hopefully that's helpful too in, in creating impetus for more, more brands to say, look, these legislative changes are coming, whether we like it or not, um, you know, we need to, we need to prepare. Yeah, I think that beyond uh, thought leadership, there's going to be an element of fear by probably the ma- majority of brands that, hey, we've got to change the way in which we're doing things or they're going to legislative, legislate us out of existence. Yeah. Um, and um, at least at the early stages, and, and particularly in the U.S., the brands that we're working with are are um, are the first group, the, the ones that know this is the right thing to do, and we've got to figure out how to do it. And that's and frankly, that's a fun group of people to work with. They're inspiring, uh, and they're they're not afraid of the hard work because that's all this is is just hard work. It's just work, but it's possible. Well, on that note, I'm going to say thank you very much for your time, Stephen. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Um, continue the, the great work. And if there's anything, any last words you want to say to inspire people to do more or, um, you know, how to participate better in the in this whole textile recovery and, and, and reuse, go ahead and have that. I, uh, I think that, that honestly, Ken, the work that you're doing and by people just listening to this is the first real step. I mean, you said it, uh, it, you know, by people being aware is the first step. And, uh, you know, and the minute we said we were aware that smoking is bad for us, you know, you're not going to be a sexy cowboy <laughs> riding right. around. It, it, all of a sudden, you, you know, by listening to a podcast like yours, by, by, you know, by participating in the awareness, that's, that's, yeah, as Francis Bacon said, knowledge is power. Yeah. Well, and I've changed the shoes that I bought to work with companies and startup companies that are using, you know, fibers made from old coffee grounds and, you know, things like that, where people are trying to do that hard work. Uh, They're trying to, to make a change, trying to reutilize materials. Sometimes in very creative ways, sometimes in, in you know straightforward ways. Um, but I think this is this is part of what we have to do is to support the change, support the hard work of those who are clearly you know trying to make a difference. So thank you for well all that you do. Um, <laughs> if you would like um, some of your folks to send me a, a, an image or two and uh, some links, I'll be happy to put them in the uh, in the text with the podcast and uh, i'll let everybody know when it's uh, ready for prime time in a week or so time okay well thanks for the work I, I it is really it's important man i i'm i mean you're part of creating an ecosystem that is supporting all of our efforts so what 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 well, well, well done well thank you i appreciate it and uh, <laughs> anything i can do then don't hesitate to have folks get in touch with me and we'll um, see what what can be done Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.
You've been listening to the Circularity Edge podcast. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Google Play to get new, fresh weekly episodes. For more, please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, or visit our website at www.circularityedge.com. Until next time, bye, Circular. Circular.